Good evening, or good late afternoon. My name is Donna Baines. I'm the director of the UBC School of Social Work. And I'd like to give you all a very warm welcome for joining us here uh, for the annual Richard B. Splain Lectured in Social Policy. And as we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral, traditional, unceded lands of the Musqueam people. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders, teachers, knowledge keepers, and students, past, present, and emerging, and welcome this opportunity to learn together with you. Um, just a few announcements before we get started. We're, of course, uh, very grateful to the uh, Richard Splain um, uh, estate for uh, providing the funds for this annual lecture. Um, we're very happy to have our guests here today and they'll be introduced in, in just a moment. I'd like to um, let you know that we will be recording this event. There's the option of using closed captions at the bottom of your screen if you should choose. And please use the, um, uh, the chat function for any questions and we will have time for questions at the end of the program. So I'll turn it over now to my uh, colleague, uh, Patsy George, for some background to this annual lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Donna. On behalf of uh, UBC School of uh, Public Policy and Global Affairs, UBC School of Social Work, and the United Nations Association in Canada Vancouver branch, let me welcome all of you to this annual public lecture on social policy. I am Patsy George, former president of the United Nations Association in Vancouver, and I'm speaking from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, namely Squamish, Marskriam, and Slavichus people known as Vancouver. Please refer to the program notes already shared with you to find more detailed information about the three sponsoring organizations. For those of you who are new to this lecture, it's important that we share a bit of history with you. Again, in your program notes, you would have seen a short bio of Dr. Splain. Dick, as he was known to a lot of us, was the assistant deputy minister with health and welfare in Ottawa, a professor of international development and acting director of UBC School of Social Work, and also a president of United Nations Association in Canada, Vancouver branch. As a social policy expert and social reformer, Dick chose the route of public service and academic work to make Canada a better place for ordinary people, for the poor, for families with young children, people with special needs, seniors, the unemployed, and the newcomers to Canada. He believed in engaging the public but particularly the students in social policy debates where issues of social justice, human rights, and peace were discussed. He truly believed that we can and must influence the public policy development in our country. So 15 years ago, when Dick turned 90 years old, the United Nations Association and UBC decided to honor him by hosting a public lecture in his name annually. Dick and his wife, Werner, equally influential in her own right, attended all the lectures while they were alive. Dick passed away in 2015 after entering his hundreds year. I want to acknowledge some of his closest friends who have joined us year after year, who are with us today as well. During the last few years, we have been able to focus on a number of policy issues close to Dick's heart, namely immigration, poverty eradication, human rights, pension reform, indigenous peoples of Canada and the need for reconciliation, homelessness, and policies to protect children and advocate for them locally and globally, hunger and food security issues. This year, the focus is on seniors 
and health policies related to caring for them. Those of us who are privileged to know Deck and Werner personally or were his students know that public policy must include both economic and social policies. Economic development without social development will not bring equality and justice. Dick's legacy will remain the way he was, instrumental in shaping Canadian social policy. So welcome to the 15th annual Richard B. Splain Lecture on Social Policy and Discussions. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Patsy. Uh, I'm Tim Staten. I'm a professor at the School of Social Work at Vancouver. I'm actually currently in New York, so I'm coming to you a little later than the rest of you. Uh, but it's my, my real pleasure to, to uh, moderate this session for you tonight. Um, and the way we're going to, to work tonight is we'll have three 10-minute presentations from each of our panelists, and then a very brief uh, inter-panel discussion, and then we'll open up to questions. So we hope we can have uh, uh, enough time for a robust debate on, on really what is over the last two and a half years, we have learned a very flawed system of long-term care. So we think we have three panelists who, uh, who are at the coal face of this debate and can help us understand the way forward and literally address the, the truly fatal flaws that we found exist in our system. So uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction of each, but if you refer to your uh, um, information, you'll find a detailed bio. So our first speaker really probably needs no introduction to most of you. Isabel McKenzie is the senior advocate for British Columbia and uh, has released numerous uh, powerful reports. Uh, and I'm sure we're gonna hear some of the findings of those tonight. Uh, previous to being the seniors uh, advocate, she was the CEO of a, a large, the largest nonprofit in British Columbia and was awarded CEO of the year for that work. Uh, she'll be followed by Professor Pat Armstrong, is a uh, distinguished research professor emeritus from York University. Uh, she has published widely on issues of care, caring, women's paid care work, unpaid care work, long-term care, and probably one of the more relevant aspects of her very uh, full career is she led a 10-year international study on reforming, uh, reimagining long-term care. So welcome, Pat. And finally, we have Mara Kerwin, who is with the Health Employees Union. She is the, the head of their private sector uh, work. Uh, she has 30 years experience in, in union and labor music movement and has been very involved in a, in a range of social issues uh, through the union movement. Uh, and we're really happy that, that we'll have that perspective as our final panel. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome all three of our panelists and all of our guests, and I look forward to a robust discussion. So over to you, Isabel. Thank you, uh, Tim, and thanks uh, for organizing this and inviting me to participate, and hello to everybody uh, in the audience. I'm looking forward to the days when I can see the audience again, and uh, welcome to my fellow uh, panel members. So I was asked to speak at the Splain Lecture, which is this year entitled uh, Crisis in Long-Term Care. And I'm going to start off by saying I may be a little bit more optimistic, and I want to call it uh, long-term care at a crossroads uh, in British Columbia. And maybe, I'll, maybe that's overly optimistic, but uh, that's, uh, I, I'm going to uh, hold on to that thought at least for a little while longer. And I say at a crossroads because, as Tim uh, referenced, what has happened in the pandemic is that the revelation of the flaws in the long-term care system aren't new to people like me or Pat or uh, Mora or some of you probably who are listening to this lecture, but they were new to most British Columbians and most Canadians. And that's because the reality is most British Columbians 
will never see and have never seen the inside of a nursing home and actually don't know somebody who's in a nursing home. And that has been part of the challenge that in the end, it's a relatively small group of people. In any given year, it's 35,000, 40,000 out of 5 million British Columbians that live in long-term care. And part of the challenge has been for people of uh, like Pat and Maura and others who work in this area has been for the attention needed to be focused on the flaws in the system. It has suited uh, everybody, frankly, very well to think, yes, we take care of our elderly people. We have a great system, you know, uh, nobody's deprived a nursing home uh, simply because they are unable to pay for it. And that's true. We have a very egalitarian uh, long-term care system here in British Columbia but, and in Canada. But uh, certainly I think the issues around uh, the lack of certain, uh, whether it's the level of staffing, the uh, um, consistency of the staffing, uh, the expertise and skills of the staff that we find in long-term care, uh, and, and an underlying theme, uh, I think, that we saw in other aspects of long-term care in um, throughout the pandemic, where there was simply a focus on these core clinical functions and the system's really only obligation was to meet those instead of the broader uh, obligation to meet the total needs of people living in long-term care, which is uh, their, the, the totality of their experience, not just the clinical outcomes, but uh, the socialization and all of the things that uh, make life worth living. And before the pandemic uh, started, my office did a survey of all publicly funded long-term care homes in British Columbia and asked residents and their family members about what life was there, life was like living in the care home. And some people had good things to say, actually. Uh, most care homes had some people living there that had good things, very good, and some very good things to say about their care home. Uh, but many did not have such good things to say about their care home. And when we looked at what are some underlying themes, common themes, one of the things uh, that came out loud and clear was uh, this sense of isolation and loneliness that people living in long-term care feel, even though they're surrounded by other people all the time. When we asked about belonging and attachment and all these other kinds of things. And at the core of it is that your experience of quality of life in long-term care on a day-to-day -day basis is about having people around you who have enough time, um, who are the same person often enough to get to know you, that they will engage with you, that they will ask your story, know who you are, know about who you were before you came into long-term care, engage with you on a day-to-day -day basis in meaningful conversations, ask opinions, be able to have that kind of um, sense of belonging, engagement, and attachment that we're obviously not achieving in long-term care. And a large part of it uh, does link back to staffing. And I know the speakers who are going to follow me are going to speak about that quite a bit, that um, in uh, the care of the elderly, frankly, whether it's in the community or in long-term care, we have not been as aware of the need for us to support the people who care for the elderly, in part because 100 years ago, uh, it was families who cared for uh, their elderly relatives because people didn't live that long and they didn't live that many years after they had retired. And as it has evolved, it has continued to be highly female work. And uh, increasingly in the last few years, uh, work of the immigrant population. And both of those factors are generally what we find contribute to jobs that are lower paid. And now in this new labor market and new economy we're in, we're finding that we're not able to attract uh, the kind of uh, people that we need to attract into our continuing care sector to care for the elderly in this, uh, in this country. And so when we look at, okay, what are the, what are the, 
the um, the things that we can fix sort of in the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years. Um, we need, there are some things that are uh, long-term solutions, some things that may be a solution, but are going to be difficult to achieve. And uh, there'll be much debate and discussion on uh, whether they're a good thing. And then if they're decided, it's determined they're a good thing, how we're going to achieve that. But this is sort of if we think about what is it we can do today that is going to improve the life of someone living in long-term care tomorrow, it really is about two things. It is about the people who are working in long-term care, and it is about a culture in long-term care that values the agency and autonomy and individuality of the residents. And I am very hopeful that with the goodwill that came forward from all British Columbians and all Canadians, frankly, around we need to do better in long-term care, that that will be a catalyst for the decision makers to allocate uh, the resources, which is the very sophisticated way of saying spend the money on the long-term care system, because we really do need uh, to do that. And hand in glove with that will be a system of uh, regulatory oversight and enforcement that focuses on the outcomes that we want to achieve and puts the resident at the center of those outcomes. And I'm hopeful that there's uh, provincial work now being done on strengthening resident and family councils and making them a, a provincial voice. And I think that will be extremely helpful. Um, and I think that as we continue to recognize the value of the work of those who care for the elderly and that we show how much we value that work, that we will be able to attract the people that we need uh, to care for our elderly. And that governments will embrace uh, their obligation as regulators and their obligation to protect the vulnerable uh, adults who live in long-term care in this province. And will introduce uh, better and stronger accountabilities that can give the public greater assurance that the elderly in their province are being cared for uh, in a dignified way and that their tax dollars are being spent in the way they want them to be spent. And they've made it clear they want them to be spent uh, looking after uh, people in long-term care in a very dignified way and shifting from how we've been doing it certainly over the last uh, 20 years. So I look forward to uh, a discussion and to what uh, my colleagues on the panel are going to say as well uh, as we look to how are we going to improve long-term care in the future? What can we do to, today, tomorrow? What's five years down the road? And what's 10 years down the road? So I'll turn it back to you, Tim. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, it's a good start on our discussion. So I'll just turn it over to, to Pat now. Well, uh, thank you very much. And, and it's really an honor to participate, uh, to be invited here and to uh, share thoughts with all of you and to hear from you uh, on what we can do about the challenges to long-term care. I want to talk about five, and I'm sure that they are going to overlap with both of the other uh, speakers here. Um, and I, like Isabel, I want to focus, as we heard in Germany, on putting life into years rather than years into, uh, into life. My first of my five challenges is the call to burn them all down. In the wake of the pandemic, there are growing calls to get rid of care homes entirely and replace them to home care. And this is very much with what uh, Isabel was saying a minute ago. We certainly need more and better home care, but we have to remember that many people do not have homes. And as feminists used to say, not all homes are havens in a heartless world. 
they can be socially, physically, financially, and psychologically abusive, and they can be lonely. And we can't provide 24-hour care for every person in their private home. So what usually means that uh, this means is that we rely on women untrained and unpaid for the job to provide the care in the home. And they do so at considerable cost. As Statistics Canada's documents uh, say, quote, the impact on physical and mental health, participation in the labor force, pressure on personal finances, and reduced time available for other activities, all are problems for those who provide unpaid care. And women are more likely than men to experience difficulties as a result of their caregiving duties, particularly as women represent the majority of caregivers in Canada. End of Statistic Canada's quote. But there are, are as uh, we just heard, positive reasons for care homes. When we asked a residence council meeting if there was anything better about being in a care home compared to their private homes, they unanimously said yes. They gave three reasons. First, they feel safe. When asked why, one woman said her stroke made her forget things and someone makes sure she takes her insulin. Second, they have company. And if they're at home, they, they would be alone. And it's, as Isabel said, they don't always like that company, but at least there are people around. And third, they have activities. And at home, it would only be TV. And someone makes sure that they have food, clean clothes, and a bath, even if it's not often enough. Of course, we need improvements in these homes, but we need to start by seeing these homes as a positive alternative and build on the positive things about congregate care, reimagining them as we called our project. A pre-pandemic study in Sweden found that a majority would prefer residential to care home care if they needed help with more than activities more than twice daily. So we can ask why older people feel that way in Sweden and why do families there not feel guilty when their relatives go into a home and then build on that. Which takes me to challenge two, namely the conditions of work. As we have long argued, the conditions of work are the conditions of care. And many of those conditions are familiar now, and I'm sure our next speaker is going to uh, focus on those conditions. And uh, I'm just going to say that top of the list is staffing levels, as we, we just heard uh, from Isabel as well. Care homes in Sweden with similar resident populations have at least twice as many workers as we have in uh, Canada, and as we saw in our surveys. And no Canadian jurisdiction comes close to meeting the minimum of four hours of care per resident per day that was established well over a decade ago when residents had fewer care needs. So I'm going to leave the rest of those conditions um, given the time limits, but less familiar is the time required for teams to reflect together on care for residents and the need for autonomy in responding to individual needs based on recognizing the skills of staff. And of course, the overwhelming majority of those needing and providing care are women, many of them newcomers, and are racialized, as we've heard already. And, but I think this helps us explain why this area is so neglected. Missing from the discussion of conditions of work, though, are those for the family that we have started to call family workers. They are providing essential care as was made all too visible during the pandemic. They do body work, they advocate, educate, provide social and physical activities, as well as hire private companions to name only some of the work they do. And much of this work is essential because there are not enough hands as we heard over and over again but in Sweden, we were told families do not do this work because they have enough hands. Although Canadian families do this work, our search of manuals, policies, and pamphlets from homes did not find definitions of tasks, hours, equipment, supports, health and safety, or training programs, or much on benefits and limits for this work by family workers. Indeed, it seldom recognizes work just like housework. 
In addition to reducing demand for this work by providing more paid care, we need to recognize this work and assess the conditions required to have it done and to be done safely. Which takes me to my third challenge, which is namely privatization. As the Ontario Long-Term Care Commission recognized, for-profit homes have lower wages and benefits, fewer staff, uh, higher staff turnover, and lower staff skill mixes. They have lower quality of care, they have older homes that are more likely to have three and four person rooms and therefore crowding. And not surprisingly, perhaps, the wait list for these homes is shorter because they're last on the list when people are looking for a care home. But uh, as I'm sure you know, the ownership of homes is less of an issue in BC, but another aspect of ownership is the contracting out of services that is found commonly in BC. Such contracting out raises questions about quality, particularly obvious with food cooked off the premises and warmed up on site. Contracted services also undermine teams and disrupt continuity. When agency workers, for instance, come into a home for short periods of time, they create more work for the home's employees as we saw during the pandemic and as BC addressed when they limited workers to uh, one home at a time. And we need to do that as well for the contracted services. The, and we have to think about the importance of dietary, housekeeping and laundry services as being central to the staff and to critical care. It, we've done a book called Wash, Wear and Care when we talk about how clothes are central to dignity and respect and have to be treated as central to care. And, and that is the case for the people who do that work as well. So my next challenge is not related to issues about profit, although it is about tensions. There's a well-known tension between medical and social care with medical care winning in terms of priorities, given the limited staff and the insufficient time for care. The tension between safety and risk has become obvious as the pandemic developed, leading first to the exclusion and then, then to the inclusion of families. But there is still a tension between families and staff over who knows best about what, a tension that can undermine the recognition of this as skilled work. And there's a tension about bringing in newcomers to fill the gaps in care without improving working conditions or ensuring appropriate skills. So the main point I want to make about tensions is that they have to be recognized, not with the intent of eliminating them, but of recognizing and figuring out how to balance them. It's complicated, which is why we need to address them. Life, for example, is boring without risk, but risk is often not only personal, but collective. So this brings me to my fifth and final point, and this is one that was also raised by Isabel, and that is the competing demands on monies, initiatives, and programs. We're hearing increasing calls to cut back spending in order to address the deficit, to invest in guns rather than care, calls to shift to home care, to name only some. Long-term care was in the spotlight when death rates were so high, but it's, it's disappearing yet again from the agenda. And there is also a competition for the labor force, one that is international and not just national and local. So calls to eliminate care homes, the importance of working conditions and addressing them, for-profit care, tensions and competing agendas are only five of the many challenges we face in addressing the long-term care crisis and making it as good as it can be, as Isabel reminded us but we have literally hundreds of commissions and studies to provide us with clear guidelines on moving forward. We just need the political will and the money to do it. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing from you and I'll try and be visible and audible next time. Thank you very much, Pat. That was, that was a really useful, succinct set of questions, challenges, issues that, that uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of further discussion on. Uh, just a, a reminder to our guests, there is a Q&A function you can type your questions into, 
and we will uh, we, we will likely have far more questions than we can answer. So we're going to try to collate as we go. So if folks are coming up with questions, put them into the chat sooner rather than later, and we will try to to make sure we address your issue uh, with the panel when we get to that point. So over to our last speaker, uh, Mara, over to you. And I see you're ready to roll with no mute and visuals ready to go. Great, thank you so much. And um, really, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you all tonight. And I just wanna start by saying that I'm coming to you from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, um, the ancestral home of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh. And I've asked to, been asked to focus my remarks this evening on kind of what is HE's place in the public discourse around um, seniors care and the challenges that our members face. And I'm going to focus particularly on our members who work in the private for profit sector, because while there are problems throughout the system, uh, through, from our perspective and based on the work that we've done with our members, the, the problems are most acute in, in this particular sector. HEU represents about 50,000 members uh, across the province. We represent members who mostly work in non-professional occupations in the healthcare sector. And one in three of our members is, are, is a care aide or healthcare assistant. And of course, this is the largest group of workers uh, in the long-term care and assisted living sector. And of that number, about 7,000 members work in care aids, I'm sorry, work in private for profit, uh, long-term care and assisted living facilities. And when we talk about uh, the independent sector or the private for profit sector, we're talking about uh, a workplace that's not covered by one of the provincial statutory bargaining units, which the majority of our members are, are covered by. And it's really difficult to talk about what's happening today in long-term care if we don't understand sort of what's happened over the last uh, 20 years. And although the labor relations regime in health is a bit complicated, uh, suffice to say that you know, different governments um, have used the labor relations environment to strengthen or in some cases dismantle and fragment the long-term care uh, system. And when we look back over you know, the last 20 years, I mean, the, 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 sort of the greatest demise from our perspective um, in the long-term care sector happened in around uh, 20, uh, 20, 20, um, 2001 to 2003, when the Liberal government of the day introduced Bills 29, which was the so-called Healthcare Delivery Improvement Act, and a companion piece of legislation in 2003, Bill 94, the Health Sector Partnership Act. And these pieces of legislation really started to dismantle what we had established as a sector that had a common standard, a common collective agreement, common sort of uh, wages, working conditions for all workers in the sector. But what Bill 29 did was it allowed the government to contract out uh, public sector work. Um, and by extension, uh, Bill 94, sort of allowed the extension of Bill 29 to sort of leak into the long-term care sector with the creation of, you know, public, uh, with, with the creation of partnerships uh, with private operators and where more and more uh, long-term care facilities were built by the private sector, not covered by the statutory regime, which allowed for much more fragmentation uh, in the system. And what we saw over, over the last 20 years is essentially a proliferation of long-term care operators um, in the private profit sector, where there are no sort of regulatory standards um, that impose a particular kind of labor relations re regime. 
and where employers, you know, negotiate independent collective agreements with the union on a case by case basis. And really what that has done, it has driven down wages substantially. It's also reduced the number of workers in the system because between 2002 and 2008, approximately 8,000 HU members, mostly women, mostly racialized workers, were fired from hospital support services and the long-term care sector. I mean, it was actually the largest mass firing of women in Canadian history. So that um, deterioration of what were common standards for workers um, has really created a sort of a schism in, 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 in the sector uh, where you know, workers in the public sector are generally treated much more fairly than workers in the private sector. Um, you know, what we see is the deterioration of standards, very little oversight, almost no transparency, and where profit drives the decisions on who to hire, you know, how much to pay them, and to what degree uh, employers will offer employment security to, 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 to workers. And if I can give you an example, I, I will say that in, 2000, in, in 2007, for example, um, care aides in the public sector made $20.95 an hour, and a housekeeper made $17 an hour. By comparison, after the work began to be either contracted out or deregulated from a sort of a, a, a common standard, um, care aides made as little as $15 an hour and support service workers $12 an hour. And in addition, collective agreements didn't pri provide for the same level of benefits. There was very little paid sick time and generally there are no pensions. In, in this in the private sector, which of course is fundamental to the you know the retirement security of workers and particularly women. Today in the public sector, uh, a care aide makes twenty five dollars and eighty three cents an hour, and their counterparts in the private sector, where wages vary but a care aide can make as little as $17.50 an hour. So there is a huge gap in wages. Uh, and that's before we get to the other kind of terms and conditions that workers have to, um, have to work, work with. And of course, it doesn't deal with issues around, as I say, benefits, pension plans, um, and other protections. In fact, in 2018, Isabel's office uh, reported that only 54 of 187 contracted long-term care operators paid the same wages as were provided for in the public sector. Operators continually uh, contract out, uh, contracts are flipped, which drove down wages and payroll costs. And before the labor code changed in 2019, uh, there was no guarantee that when work was contracted out, workers would follow their job, their collective agreement would go with them, and so would their union. And in fact, very often, senior employees were not rehired. And so what emerged was a system that didn't value the workers who, who care for elders. The lack of continuity in care, as both Isabel and Pat have referred to, has a really adverse impact on vulnerable seniors who come to rely on staff whom they often form strong emotional bonds with. And those strong emotional bonds you know, add quality to the care that staff can provide. And workers simply can't survive on 14 to $17 an hour. The workers become precarious. Workers are always chasing a better paying job. And many workers have two jobs or more just 
just to make ends meet. And you know, staffing levels were at a crisis before the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic has made it worse, where particularly in the long-term care sector, staff simply don't have the time to provide the very basic needs that seniors require. The sectors become very harsh, staffing levels are critically low, and care is compromised as staff you know, struggle to provide personal care like toileting, feeding, bathing, and other activities of, of daily living. You know, the first COVID death in a BC care home uh, was reported at Lynn Valley Care Centre, where the staff there were contracted out and at the time were non-union, were non-union. And we know that through the spring of 2020, COVID swept through long-term care facilities, residents became ill and died, and as staff went from facility to facility, uh, they, they, they took COVID with them. And so the fractures in the continuing care sector were exposed in a way that you know, we hadn't seen before, which both Isabel and Pat have referred to low staffing levels, poor infection control practices, insufficient employer policies, inf insufficient training, and you know, very, very low morale. And so at the time, the government had to move quickly, and the provincial health officer, as we know, um, introduced the single site orders um, in order to, to attempt to stem the rapid infection rates and the deaths. That had a significant impact on the entire sector as 45,000 workers in the long-term care and assisted living sector were affected by the single site order. Because one in five workers had more than two jobs. So, you know, we worked with government and the provincial health officer um, to implement the single site orders. Um, you know, it wasn't without controversy. Um, but it was a mechanism that allowed for some stability in the system. But of course, we couldn't address the issue, I mean, but we could not fail to address the issue of wages because so many workers had more than one job. To simply say that workers could only work in one facility would have a very devastating impact on their income. And so the government, to their credit, uh, introduced a measure of leveling up wages so that uh, long-term care workers across the long-term care system were all paid at the same rate of pay. And that was the public sector rate. Now that's cost the government $16 million a year, which I would say is a, a subsidy to the private for-profit operators who already receive funding from the public purse. I mean, in addition to the crisis, we worked with government on staffing issues because as people have referred to, you know, the lack of staffing in long-term care is at a perilously low level. And you know, the government, again, made some initial um, investments in training of care aides in particular and have, have um, instituted a program where they're gonna train 7,000 new healthcare assistants to a tune of about $44 million. So we've worked very closely with the government and the provincial health officer to try and stabilize the system that, 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 they're, that are in place in the long-term care sector throughout the system, but most particularly felt, as I say, in the private for profit sector. But you know, as life uh, returns to normal for some of us, um, as we, you know, as, as COVID abates, uh, the struggle in the long-term care sector is, is far from over. Um, we released a poll just last week that said one in three care workers has told us they're likely to leave the healthcare system in the next two years. So the crisis that we face in staffing, you know, unless we do something significantly, unless we, you know, meet the challenge of the crossroads that Isabel referred to, we are going to continue to deal with a chaotic 
and fragmented system. You know, in 2004, HEU had approximately 20 collective agreements in the independent long-term care sector. That is to say, you know, members who weren't covered by one of the big public sector collective agreements. Today, we have 118 different collective agreements with long-term care, private profit operators, and subcontractors. That's 30% of our membership who are no longer covered by a collective agreement that maintains a provincial standard. Much of the public long-term care infrastructure is crumbling as previous governments preferred private development to public bills. You know, and as we work our way out of the pandemic, um, while wage leveling is in place now, if there's not an alternative to wage leveling when single site orders come to an end, staff will simply leave. You know, our members and other workers are not prepared to work for $17 an hour after spending more than two years on the front lines of the pandemic, where really the effects of COVID have been felt the worst in the long-term care sector. Workers are exhausted, uh, they're frustrated, um, and they are deeply concerned about the conditions that seniors live in. You know, the Premier gave the Minister of Health in his mandate letter the task of moving forward a staffing and retention strategy that provides workers in long-term care and assisted living with leveled up wages, even after the pandemic ends, and to restore provincial standards for wages, benefits, and working conditions. The mandate further went on to say that the minister needed to support the delivery of better care to seniors by private operators of long-term care homes by making them more accountable for the public funds they receive. Our job as a government, our job as a union is to, to represent our members, to represent seniors and to represent their families by ensuring that the government fulfills its promise. We can't sit back and just watch the long-term care sector sort of disappear into the shadows again. Uh, you know, the, a, a bright light has been shone on long-term care and we need to continue to shine that light to ensure that the changes that are needed are made. And our biggest asset is our members who deeply care about the seniors for whom they care. They spend their entire day with seniors performing the most intimate of tasks. They frequently take the place of absent family members and are very often there when seniors die. We need to fix long-term care and the roadmap is really not that complicated. It's about re-establishing common standards for better wages, benefits, and working conditions for all workers, regardless of the setting they work in. If I work in a publicly funded, publicly operated long-term care facility, you know, my colleague across the road, the road who does exactly the same work for a private operator should enjoy the same protections that I do. We, may we, we need to make long-term care spaces public or not-for-profit rather than being operated by private companies whose motivation is profit. That's their, that's their reason for existing. We must stop contracting out care and support services, which are fundamental to supporting the work of the, of the seniors uh, in, 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 in the sector. And private companies must be forced to follow regulations, meet standards, and increase transparency. Because we know that they do not, do not spend the money that they are provided with by the, by the health authorities 
in, in providing the hours of care that they're required to. We can't afford to continue to put profit before care. And we have to see that caring for our seniors, seniors is an equality issue. Our elders and those who care for them must be able to live in dignity inside and outside of our long-term care homes. And we have a responsibility to ensure that we improve the conditions for seniors by improving the conditions for workers. The two are inextricably linked. So I look forward to the discussion and I thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mara. Uh, so I'm just gonna go back around the panel quickly and ask if uh, just having listened to your fellow panelists, do you have a quick comment uh, on anything you've heard? So let's uh, go back to Isabel for any Quick thoughts on what you've heard? Well, I obviously uh, agree with what my uh, fellow panel members have said. Uh, I just want to get to uh, some of the sort of the practical things that uh, Maura was referring to in terms of long-term care here in British Columbia and what is it we can do uh, tomorrow, if you will, to try and improve the care. And certainly this issue around how, uh, how we manage these contracted care homes, which are the majority of them, and they're about half of them are not for profit and half of them are for profit. And even here in BC, uh, the prevailing theme is still there that you, you see these differences owned and operated, then the not for profit, and then the for profit. And so you see higher levels of staffing, higher levels of RN um, uh, in the owned and operated, less uh, a little bit in the not-for-profit, but less again in the for-profit, right? So we do see that is a, a fairly consistent theme uh, that has happened. But it, it, is, it will be interesting to see over the next year or two um, how the government is going to manage uh, its contracted long-term care sector in BC as we transition out of COVID and all of the supports that were offered during COVID and the expectation around uh, monitoring. I still am concerned that we tend to take a, a light touch approach, if you will, to our role as a regulator. And I don't think that has served the residents uh, particularly well, and I don't think it served the taxpayers of British Columbia particularly well. Um, having said that, obviously uh, there are instances where, uh, where it has, but I think if you look overall at the emerging themes, um, we do need to make some changes there. Thank you. Also, uh... oh. oh. Am I the only one that's lost him? No. Uh, no, he's frozen on my screen. <laughs> well, why don't why don't I just step in then? Uh, should we pop over to Pat? Uh, well, I wanted to pick up on um, Mara's last issue about uh, legislation. Although I was going to say before that, I find it. Uh, the latest news is Chartwell that who, that owns a lot of the homes in, uh, especially in my province of Ontario, has just sold out to a, Amer a large American company, and we're we're seeing even uh, greater expansion and consolidation in this area, which I think is concerning. I was going to say, in terms of the federal role, and I know this is also a, a question uh, in the chat. Um, we have a, a group called the Care Economy Group has suggested that what we need to do, at, what we need from the federal level is funding some quite some standards at, of the sort that we have in the Canada Health Act uh, that we have to prohibit uh, private uh, for-profit ownership 
and uh, that has to be comprehensive, accessible, and we have to address staffing. That we need a we need a national labor force strategy in terms of healthcare, and we needed it for a very long time, and we've called for it for a long time. And I what I was trying to briefly suggest is the argument that we can fill up these positions by importing labor without changing the working conditions, I think is, is really quite a problematic uh, issue. I'm not uh, opposing uh, newcomers coming to do jobs in Canada, but if we use that as a basis for not improving the conditions of work, then we don't improve the conditions of care. We don't get to the kind of care uh, that Isabel was talking about, unless we change those conditions. That, and one of the other things I wanted to say was, uh, we we've all talked about continuity and about how important that is to teamworks. And it, what we've been hearing during, as I'm sure you have during this pandemic, is uh, how teams are even more important in supporting work workers supporting each other and helping them in terms of the mental stress they're undergoing uh, now. So I think that we really have to push on the conditions of, of work in long-term care and, and not allow a continuation of just uh, repeating these working conditions. Angela Kim is frozen again or not. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. So I'll just leap in here. Um, maybe could we hear from uh, Mara? And then I think maybe Isabel has her hand up. So she could be the first question after Mara. Yeah, I mean, I think that this question about how we engage with our seniors in long-term care and the sort of the, the time it takes to provide good care and the consistency of care that Isabel talked about. I mean, it, it is so, um, I mean, it's so important you know, to the, obviously to the seniors and the residents, but it's also incredibly important to, to our members. I mean, we hear all the time from our members how distressed they are by not having the time or the staff to actually provide the care that they, they, that they, want, they, they, they want to be able to provide and they know seniors need. And they see the deterioration of, st of, the, of the residents in terms of their social cycle, social social cycle, oh, social psycho um, uh, health, uh, because they don't have time to spend with them. You know, if you think about always rushing, 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 um, there just isn't that level of engagement that our members understand seniors need. So this, this sort of notion around, you know, the clinical care as opposed to the, you know, the psychosocial care, is so so important and you know with the critical shortages of staff um, we're just not going to get there unless we fundamentally change how we provide services provide funding how we you know deal with transparency and accountability in the sector uh, and, and our members feel that uh, you know acutely every day Thank you, Mara. Um, I see Isabel has her hand up. Maybe we'll move over there. Yes, I was just going to follow up on uh, Pat's comments about um, uh, immigrant uh, labor. We have to be very, very careful that we don't use that basically as code for cheap labor. And I, I, I think there is a bit of that when uh, certainly I find a lot of people you know, when we talk about what it is the federal government can do, we turn to them because the immigration policies are the federal government. And a lot of people will say, you know, we need uh, more robust immigration. We need immigrants in order to solve our um, human resource uh, shortage in long-term care. And what I get concerned about is that, okay, are we saying uh, we, obviously we need to increase the labor pool but I don't want it to deflect from, uh, as others have spoken about, that we need to fundamentally need to change how we value this work, because that is at the root of some of the other uh, issues in long-term care, like 
focusing on tasks, not the totality of the experience of a person living in, in long-term care. And it, it, we really have to move off this task-focused clinical approach to how we staff and manage in long-term care. We, and we, you know, we, we drifted that way actually with the best of intentions, frankly. You know, I've, I have followed that progression over the last 25 and 30 years. Uh, but like all things that started out with the best of intentions, uh, some of us may have not appreciated the unintended consequences, which is where we find ourselves at today in terms of the staffing. Okay, I am I back with you? <laughs> yes. Okay, that was a bit of an adventure, but we're all used to that now. Uh, okay, well, thank you all for those, those those comments. So, so let's move into some of the questions from the audience, and uh, we'll we'll I think just follow the same response order of of the three of you to give each a chance to respond to the different questions if you if you choose. Uh, it, one of the questions came up around the role of families and family councils and how can we strengthen the role of families and, and uh, unpaid caregivers in long-term care facilities. So Isabel, do you want to start with that one? Thanks. I think the way we strengthen them, Tim, is that we need to give a provincial voice to the resident and the family councils, the way we have a, we have a provincial uh, voice for the people who work in long-term care. We have a provincial voice for the people who operate the long-term care homes. Uh, we don't have a provincial voice for the people who live there and the people who love them. And uh, I do believe there is work going on in uh, BC right now that hopefully we will all learn of in the near future um, that is going to signify how we are going to give uh, better amplify uh, that voice in a unified provincial way. Uh, I'd be interested in Pat's comments because, of course, Ontario has, re in the last, I think, two or three years, uh, created a, a provincial level uh, family council. But I think that is what is needed. When government consults with stakeholders, right now there's no stakeholder group to consult with that is the voice of the residents and the family. The others, you know, the operators will say they speak for them. The union that represents the staff will say they speak for them. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But there's got to be uh, a venue for them to speak for themselves. Okay, thank you. Pat, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, there are family councils in Ontario and there's a provincial uh, family council organization. How We're currently doing research with them actually in Ontario in terms of COVID. And, and interestingly enough, COVID have made uh, these family councils more active. They're loud rather than required, and a lot more of them have formed during COVID, in part because uh, many of them were um, pro forma. They would get a, a, a the the director of care would come in and tell them uh, this is going on and and. Um, and then that would be the end of it, or there would be individual complaints. But increasingly what we are seeing, at least with the Family Council we've been working with, that they're becoming much more active, much more uh, interested in learning about the policies and, and practices in the home, getting involved in actually shaping some of the things that are going on in the home, including the kinds of issues that Myra was raising. So I think that uh, they can be a very powerful form. And one of the indicators we used to talk about in our research team about uh, the quality of care uh, in a nursing home and how we should measure it. And we thought one of the measures should be the extent to which uh, people wanted to stay on the family council after um, their, the the person they were related to was no longer alive. Uh, so I think that uh, they can play a role, but part of the point I was trying to make in my quick comments was that we have to create other conditions besides the condition of, of having a voice on a council, which is absolutely critical, but also 
um, make it clear uh, what the boundaries are, what they're allowed to do, provide them with education, provide them with the, the training that became so obvious during um, COVID that the uh, kinds of education that required around infection control so that they could come into uh, the residence safely for, the, uh, safely for themselves, safely for the staff, safely for the residents, uh, but also so that um, and there are often conflicts with the staff because the kinds of works that families might take up in the home may be work that staff feels that they shouldn't be doing, and but they take it up because nobody else is doing it or because they've been doing it for years at home. Um, so there has to be some, some ways for working those issues out uh, between families and staff as well. Okay, thank you, Pat. Uh, Mara, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there often are tensions between family members and staff, although I think, you know, in the current in the current environment, um, staff appreciate uh, really oh, yeah. any, help they, any help they can get and, you know, often work very closely with families. I mean, I have to say, I mean, I, we support the idea of um, family councils. I think, um, like others have said, they need to have sort of a clear mandate. They need to have some autonomy. Um, they need to have, you know, access to, um, you know, good systems that can make them productive um, and, and, and valuable. I mean, I think where there are informal family councils, I mean, what we hear is they're often dominated by the employers. Um, you know, they don't really, they don't really speak for, they don't have a real voice to speak for families, for, for residents. Um, and I think we, you know, you know, if we just sort of replicate a system like that, you know, it isn't very helpful. But if there's a more formal structure, as I say, where family councils have some autonomy, they have some authority, they can actually speak for the family members that they represent. Um, you know, it's a system that we certainly support and we work, you know, and we have often worked very closely with family members where we've been in struggles with particular employers where conditions have been particularly difficult. Um, so it's not something that I know a lot about, but it generally is something that the organization supports. I, when I was talking about tensions with staff, it was, it's part, part of the tension is, uh, could be relieved by more staff, yes. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Okay, we have an interesting question. It's kind of around the, the actual nature of the facilities that just, you know, what can we do to make them less institutional and more home-like? And I, I actually don't know, are there, how do they regulate the architecture of long-term care facilities or do they and can they? And is that something we need to be, be thinking more about? So Isabel, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, this is one of those classic areas of tensions uh, that Pat uh, spoke about uh, in long-term care, and we absolutely saw this during COVID. Um, th this is a, I, I think we have to step back and we have to say the following, this is a person's home. They haven't come to long-term care to be cured or fixed. Um, they have come to long-term care to live out what are likely the last uh, couple of years of their life. And so I think we have to keep perspective. And I think we lost the plot a bit uh, with some of the things we did uh, during COVID, at running around taking photographs off the wall and, and this type of thing. I think uh, we asked our residents in BC, you know, does this feel like home? And I think it was about half of them said, no, it doesn't feel like home. Um, I, I think, you know, there are the simple things around uh, allowing uh, personalized furnishings in the room as much as possible, et cetera, et cetera. Making larger rooms actually would be uh, a, a large step in that direction. I don't think that's practical to, to do um, in any meaningful way in, in the care homes we have. But I think um, it, it is around the obvious, the personal possessions. That's what can make it more home-like. There is a tension uh, as a care home operator between uh, sometimes what the care staff want for convenience versus what detracts from a home-like environment. Um, 
med carts in the hallways, equipment, uh, you know, in the hallways versus being put away in closets. These are kinds of things that uh, as we become more, in my opinion, sensitized to in new design where you can put these things away, uh, but there's going to be that tension. Um, and I think, you know, we have to swing back to um, this is the person's home. They're not there to be fixed or cured. It's not a clinical environment. Um, what really are we doing here? And it's very challenging for the system because we are completely calibrated to fix and cure people and to uh, you know, mitigate risk uh, to as close to zero as we can get it. And that, that the shift that's gonna be required in the thinking, all the money in the world is still not gonna fix that shift that's needed. And I do wonder if what we will see in the future, you know, getting back to comments, you know, not everybody's idea of risk is different. And, you know, the, for some people, the safety is paramount, for others, it's less so. Is whether, you know, also we've created a bit of a, a log jam with this one size fits all complex care model that we all thought was great 25 years ago. Again, the unintended consequences we didn't quite think through. We were all excited about the fact people weren't going to have to move to another care home uh, as they came in and progressed without realizing, okay, that creates another dynamic uh, that I think is at play at some of the care homes. So, you know, the, it, it's not a simple answer. It's not an answer uh, because home-like environment is different for you than it is for me. And that's the challenge. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I'm just going to add a, another wrinkle to the question that I'm, I'm primarily a disability specialist. And of course, the disability movement has spent the last 50 years trying to get out of institutions and trying to get away from the healthcare system. So in some ways, this debate always strikes me as, man, where have these guys been? <laughs> so I, I, I wonder is, so the physical environment is one, but is it also the, the kind of ideology that that is a very health dominated and, and, and so care and social care kind of will always come second in our current thing. So, so do we need a psychological shift that says we're building social care facilities that are gonna need some health components? But anyway, just to add a wrinkle for the, for the rest of the responses there. To, so Pat's. Uh, this is a, a huge and complex uh, question, as Isabel said, but in our research project, um, we visited, uh, we visited, we studied homes in uh, six different countries. We were in 25. When we, I say we, we took interdisciplinary international teams of 12 to 14 people into uh, these homes and, and for our uh, one home in the, each of these countries, we stayed over the course of a week. Um, and so we got to see lots of different homes and we spent a lot of time talking together about this, about home-like, because every country says it should be like home and should look like home. And we all had very different ideas of what home looks like. Um, some of us love the Scandinavian uh, bright colors and hardwood floors, and some people love the carpet and the, you know, it was, it was really, uh, it, we, we never came to an agreement about it. I have to say that my favorite one was a home uh, that I think Donna was at as well in Norway, where um, the, the care home was physically built into a large complex that included the town swimming pool, the town cinema, a climbing wall, a spa, a cafeteria, and, and uh, residents could leave their, uh, their uh, room, all of them had private rooms and all of their private rooms had direct access outside through sliding patio doors to a huge enclosed uh, garden. Um, and they could, as they said in this place, go out without putting your shoes on 
um, to go and watch your grandchildren swimming in the pool. And, um, and instead of the, the kind of campus of care that we're building where everybody's the same age, this was intergenerational because people moved in and out. And across the square that this huge complex was on was a shopping center and a church. So it was very much uh, part of the community and integrated in the community. And uh, oh, it had a daycare center, of course, too, but um, it, it was uh, very intergenerational. Um, but I think even at the, at the small levels like like closets. I mentioned that we did a book on uh, clothes called Wash, Wear and Care. Um, and the size of your closet makes a big difference. You know, uh, you're one of the, you're, it, and this in the disability community is very, uh, puts a lot of emphasis on this too, your identity through your clothes and your capacity to be able to, uh, to, to dress the way you want. Also, if your clothes, if your closet's the size of a locker, <laughs> Then, then you uh, then you can't do that. Two other things I'll say because I could go on and on forever about this um, is that we have a small we have a set of small uh, four small books that you can download for free and one is on physical environments and addresses some quite specific aspects of physical environments that can move us in uh, more home like directions and everything from sound and light to um, uh, to carpets. And um, the uh, last thing I was going to say is the Canadian Standards Association has a set of proposed standards on the physical environment that they have just put out. And I think that they are still open for uh, comments uh, because they're out for public consultation right now. And one of the things they talk about, and it's directly related to this institutional look question, is that they suggest that all of the units be considerably smaller and then everyone have a private room and that those rooms be uh, bigger and that you have uh, kitchens on site and you have laundries on site. And you know that it's, uh, uh, I encourage people to go, it's not easy to find on their site, but I encourage people to go on that and see what those proposed standards are. That's for Canada-wide Canadian Standards Association. I'll stop. Great, thanks, Pat. Uh, and maybe we can put a link to where folks could find those books in the in the chat. I don't know whether one of our fabulous tech folks can do that for us, but uh, uh, Mara. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is not an area of not my area of expertise, so I'm not going to say too much about it, except to say that I think that, I mean, uh, single rooms are, I think, are a very important uh, part of um, having a home-like environment, the sort of privacy, the, the, um, the, the, the personal items around you, not sharing the, the space with another person. Um, but also, I, I think that, you know, the question around how staff interact with um, residents is also part of that home-like environment. Again, if people are very task-oriented, rushing from one task to the next, uh, you know, five minutes for this, 10 minutes, you know, seven minutes for that, um, there is no real engagement, no real quality time. And I mean, and if you talk to care aides, it, for example, who've been in the system for a very long time, you know, they will tell you about, they will, will lament the time where they could actually sit with a senior and have a conversation or brush their hair or, you know, um, do some sort of something very personal and something very intimate that was important to the senior that sort of helped in um, ensuring that relationship was developed, that the person felt valued, that they felt cared about. And I think those are things that also contribute to the, to the home-like environment as well as the built environment. So I think it's a combination of, uh, of both things, which comes back to the issue around staffing and, um, and the you know, quality of care. Okay, thank you. We, we're... We're getting a little tight in time, so I'm going to ask if we can keep our, this last question, the quickie responses, the rapid question round. 
Uh, we've had several questions around regulation standards. Uh, someone asked, is there a national plan or standards? And I know that, that Pat had mentioned the new draft standards. So, so I wonder if you could make a quick comment about uh, you know, what are the role of standards and licensing and monitoring, whatever piece you want to take of that. And, you know, what is what is most critical to, to, to move forward on quickly in terms of the regulation monitoring standard side? Sorry, that's a big question for a quick answer, but Isabel. <laughs> Uh, I'll be quick. Regulations need to be specific. This broad definition of, you know, uh, sufficient to meet the needs of the resident is got us where we are today. We need in regulation, uh, whether it's the staffing levels, the ratios, we need that kind of specificity in our regulations. Um, and we need enforcement and there need to be consequences for non-compliance. Um, you know, the challenge at the end of the day is that we have a regulatory regime where the consequences for failing to meet your regulatory requirements um, uh, is simply you get uh, told you have to fix it and there's no consequence. Uh, if you're a, an operator who has many infractions or no infractions, you get paid the same. Um, there's no consequence. And I think that no regulatory regime is going to be sufficient if it isn't enforced and if there aren't consequences for lack of compliance. Okay, thank you. Pat? Uh, three things. Uh, transparency, as uh, we have all said, I think is really important. Public reporting and verified data, um, which uh, we've all talked about to some extent. Okay, thank you, Pat. Thank you for your brevity and specificity too. Uh, Myra, last word to you. Yeah, well, of course, for us, it's about, um, you know, returning standards, uh, employment standards to, to workers in the system. Um, I think it's about accountability around the funding. Um, and I think, again, there has, there has to be specific requirements that, that do um, uh, garner, uh, penalties if employers don't comply. Um, so yeah, I, that's what I'll say. Okay, well, I think we're going to have to to wrap the questions up there. I know there there's a whole long list of, of fabulous questions, so I apologize we can't get to all of them, but I, I think that speaks to the the urgency of this topic and and people are, as Isabel mentioned at the beginning, we're awake to it now, so how do we stay awake to it going forward and, and address some of these issues? Uh, and I will turn it over to Donna to convey our thanks to, to one and all. So Donna, back to you. Great, yes, it's my, uh, it's my honor to, uh, to provide thanks to our, our excellent uh, folks tonight. So first of all, I'd like to thank our three panelists. They really, uh, gave us a lot to think about, and uh, uh, they are, uh, you know, in my humble opinion, dealing with one of uh, the most pressing questions facing us at the moment. Um, so thank you very much to Isabel McKenzie, the Seniors Advocate here in BC, Pat Armstrong, um, Emeritus Distinguished Research Prof from York University, and uh, Maura Kirwan from the Hospital Employees Union. Um, also, I would like to thank Patsy George for her tireless hard work on uh, the 15 years of the Dick Splain lectures, and also for her endless commitment to building a better world. Um, you're an inspiration to us, Patsy, and thank you for being part of this. Also, uh, to Tim Stanton for his excellent moderating. Third, I'd like to thank our Zoom support folks from the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. That's Lindsay Marsh and Reza Gabrielle. Um, I do want to also acknowledge uh, Dick Splain for the fine example he set for all of us is close engagement with social policy um, and equity issues and, and his efforts to, uh, to make the world a better place. Fifthly, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, the United Nations Association in Canada, Vancouver branch, and 
our School of Social Work here at UBC. And sixth, I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, thank you so much for your attendance, for making this a, a successful and um, memorable event. And I hope that you join us all next year when we may even get to be back in person or at least hybrid or whatever new form we have at that point in time. Thank you very much. So I guess we'll say good night here. <laughs> Thanks everybody. <laughs>